everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Lackawanna Pastimes. I'm Sarah Puccini, the Assistant Director at the Lackawanna Historical Society, and this month we're still marking Anthracite Heritage Month with a coal mining related program. Uh, this year will also be the 100th anniversary of the dedication of the John Mitchell Memorial Statue on, La on Scranton's Courthouse Square. Uh, so we're looking ahead to that uh, that celebration in May. Uh, today we'll be talking a little bit about uh, the history of, of John Mitchell and the United Mine Workers and the installation and dedication of the statue itself. Um, I'll be joined a little bit later by Darlene Miller Lanning, the director of the Hope Horn Gallery at the University of Scranton. We'll talk a little bit about the artistic impact and this this symbolism that's included in the monument itself. All right. Um, John Mitchell himself, if you're un unfamiliar with him, um, Mitchell is revered as something of a saint in the anthracite region. He rose to prominence as the president of the United Mine Workers Union, successfully navigating through strikes in 1900 and 1902, the latter of which set the stage for an eight hour workday and cemented the union as an actual authority. Mitchell and the UMW succeeded where others had failed. John Siney and the Workingmen's Benevolent Association in the 1870s, Terence Powderly and the Knights of Labor in the 1880s and 1890s. John Mitchell worked to unite a dis disparate set of ethnic groups working in the coal fields by noting, we're all the same color when we come out of the mines. At Mitchell's funeral in 1919, thousands passed through St. Peter's Cathedral to pay their last respects, and overflow crowds filled the surrounding streets during the service. It's fitting, and perhaps obvious, uh, that the first monument erected on Scranton's Courthouse Square, not dedicated to a military leader, was erected in memory of John Mitchell. Mitchell himself was born on February 4, 1870, in Braidwood, Illinois, to Robert Mitchell and his second wife, Martha Haley. His mother died His mother died, and a few years later, his father passed away as well, after being trampled by a runaway team of horses. Uh, he was raised in poverty by his father's third wife and early on was forced to drop out of school in order to support his stepmother and his siblings. Mitchell was abused by his stepmother and suffered from loneliness, making few friends as a child. When he was 12, he became employed at the Chicago, Wilmington, and Vermilion Coal Company and began to gain the skills of a miner. He then joined his first union and as a member of the union, was able to participate in a joint conference between the miners and mine owners after the owners decreased the miners' wages. This is when he first witnessed the power of workers uniting to make negotiations with those in charge. The union won. Um, at age 16, Mitchell went west and spent several years looking for work. In 1892, he met and married Catherine B. O'Rourke and the couple settled down in Spring Valley, Illinois. In 1894, he became the United Mine Workers Union's subdistrict organizer, and a few years later was elected to be the subdistrict's secretary treasurer. He faced both successes and failures in those positions until he was elected vice president of the union in 1898 and finally president in 1899, making him at only age 28 in charge of the most powerful union of the period. It was the beginning of the union era. Union membership was rising across the country, spurred by economic growth and expansion, and increasingly employers were signing contracts with unions and accepting collective bargaining agreements. Mitchell reached a turning point in his career with the anthracite strike of 1900. The groundwork for the strike was laid by unexpected results of strikes in the bituminous or soft coal fields in 1897. A depression in 1893 forced down wages, and according to a Pennsylvania Legislative Committee, Many, many, many miners lived like sheep in shambles. Mitchell managed to arrange an end to the strike after five weeks when political pressure from Republicans hoping to re-elect President McKinley forced many mine owners to, pay, to post a pay increase. They still refused to recognize the union, but Mitchell took the wage increase as a win and dropped the fight to recognize the union, calling an end to the strike. Both sides, stru both sides struck a bonanza as operators both raised wages and prices. Coal companies prospered and union membership soared from 10,000 to 115,000. Nevertheless, the strike propelled Mitchell into fame for his skill as negotiator and labor leader. The strike gave him the opportunity to refine these skills and he was able to make important friends in Washington, which would be of use to him later. He was viewed favorably by the press and was declared to be a responsible, respectable and reasonable union leader who could be trusted. This was the beginning of his transition from labor activist and organizer to a conservative leader of a bureaucratic institution. Although it looked like a success and placated miners and operators and politicians, the settlement of the 1900 strike did not address the main concern, rec the recognition of the union. It set the stage for another larger strike in 1902, which would turn John Mitchell into a, into a larger than life symbol for the labor movement. Miners struck on May 12, 1902, followed by firemen, engineers, and pump men on June 2nd, 
um, setting the stage for a long and bitter fight. Commissioner of Labor Carol D. Wright wrote of the 147,000 strikers. 30,000 30, soon left the region, and of these, 8 to 10,000 did return to Europe. As the strike drags on, Mitchell exhorted the miners to remain peaceable, but his advice wasn't always heeded. On Friday, October 3, 1902, President Theodore Roosevelt called a precedent-shattering meeting, changing the government's role from strikebreaker to peacemaker. He summoned representatives of both sides of the strike to discuss the problem at a temporary White House at 22 Lafayette Place, Washington, D.C. The approach of winter threatened a coal famine, and Roosevelt feared, uh, feared untold misery with the certainty of riots which might develop into social war. With all the earnest, earnestness that there is in me, the president urged, I ask that there be an immediate resumption of operations in the coal mines in some such way as will meet the crying needs of the people. For Mitchell, the calling of the conference implied union recognition. Sensing victory, he was at his conciliatory best. Mitchell, Roosevelt wrote, behaved with great dignity and moderation, while the operators, on the contrary, showed extraordinary stupidity and bad temper. The operators, chief among them George Bear, president of the Reading Railroad, were rude to the president, and they criticized Mitchell as a, as a leader of agitators and extremists who was locking thousands out of work. In contrast, Mitchell's soft-spokenness and conservative approach were already winning the war of public opinion. When they made, Bear's pu Bear made public Bear's arrogant divine right letter, Mitchell and the UMW turned him into the villain by allowing the laboring men that Bear disparaged to become sympathetic figures rather than the menace the unions were previously assumed to be. Roosevelt's conference was ultimately a failure, as the government had really no legal right to intervene, and the coal operators rejected Roosevelt's efforts and refused to deal with Mitchell or acknowledge the union in any way. As the governor of Pennsylvania sent the state national guard to the coal fields, Roosevelt brought in an even bigger gun, J.P. Morgan. Ruth's Secretary of War, Elihu Root, and Morgan created a contract for arbitration, allowing the miners to return to work while a commission considered the issues. With the establishment of the Anthracite Coal Strike Commission, Mitchell called off the strike on October 23rd. It had lasted for 163 days. There were seven recorded deaths and numerous stories of terror and crime committed on both sides, but the Great Strike earned reputation as being one of the most organized strikes to date. In Wilkes-Barre, after the UMW voted to accept Roosevelt's arbitration plan, Mitchell said, the strike itself has demonstrated the power and dignity of labor. Conservative, intelligent trade unionism has an impetus, the effect of which cannot be measured. I earnestly hope and fervently believe that both labor and capital have learned lessons from the minor strike, which will enable them to adopt peaceful, humane, and business methods of adjusting wage differences in the future. In the end, when the commission announced their verdict in March of 1903, the strike was again not a total, su total success. Mitchell had secured his place in history. A sliding scale was introduced to tie wages to production, and the miners received a 10% increase in wages. The much lauded eight-hour workday was secured for firemen and engineers, while the miners had to be content with a nine-hour day, still better than the 10 hours they were working before. Although the UMW was still unrecognized as a union, Samuel Gompers would later call the strike the most important single incident in the labor movement in the United States. Mitchell already had his own holiday. October 29th, the end of the 1900 anthracite strike, was celebrated as John Mitchell Day the year before with parades and mass meetings from Hazleton to Forest City. Speaking to a crowd of more than 8,000 at Westside Park in Wilkes-Barre, Mitchell spoke about his continued quest for an eight-hour workday and noted, I cannot conceive why the miners should not should not receive better wages than any other class of labor in the land. He drives every wheel that turns. At present, it is most honest and most despised, but as we are, we made ourselves. As in 1901, the newly reopened mines were closed again in 1902 for the celebrations, which included parades in West Granton, Carbondale, and Oliphant. The 1902 strike catapulted Mitchell to national fame. He was the figurehead for labor and the darling of the press. His tenure with the UMW was short-lived, however, and Mitchell stepped down in 1908 after a series of disastrous strikes in Colorado and some shifty backroom dealing with anthracite and bituminous operators in 1906. Many disagreed with his policies and conservative bureaucratic approach. Socialists and more radical labor leaders like Big Bill Haywood and the Wobblies, citing his friendship with Andrew Carnegie, Mark Hanna, and Theodore Roosevelt, denounced Mitchell as too big for his britches and too comfortable with bigwigs and a lavish lifestyle. 
Mitchell may have lost his role in the UMW and drawn criticism from other labor advocates, but his popularity in Scranton never diminished. When he died on September 9, 1919, thousands passed through St. Peter's Cathedral to see Mitchell's body lying in state. Thousands more stood on the street surrounding the cathedral during the funeral service. Bishop Hoban called him one of God's noblemen, one of the makers of the Lackawanna Valley, and the father of the miners. It is no surprise, then, that it didn't take long for plans to develop to commemorate Mitchell's work with the statue. Within days of Mitchell's death, the UMW passed a resolution to erect a memorial statue, but their good intentions were ironically delayed by strikes again in the region in the anthracite and bituminous fields. By the summer of 1920, the international headquarters of the UMW began soliciting donations from union locals to raise, at the time, what was going to be $65,000 for a suitable memorial to Mitchell, originally suggested for his bur burial place in Cathedral Cemetery. In January of 1922, a com committee met with Mitchell's wife, Catherine, and with Bishop Hoban, and their plans began to expand from a simple memorial tablet at the cemetery to a larger memorial at either Courthouse Square or Nayad Park in Scranton. William Green, the International Secretary of the UMW, noted that several designs had been submitted to the committee, but none were selected since the nature of the memorial will depend on the location and its surroundings. After meeting with Scranton Mayor John Durkin on January 6, 1922, the Miners Committee settled on Courthouse Square for the new memorial. Durkin immediately sent City sol Solicitor Philip Mattis to look into the legalities of ownership on the square. County Commissioner Morgan, Th Morgan Thomas, Louis Von Bergen, and Thomas Quinlan, and Judges H.M. Edwards and George Maxey approved the site in February. And in March, the UMW commissioned Hazleton architect Peter B. Sheridan, himself a former breaker boy, to design the memorial. Sheridan worked with city mining engineers to ensure a solid footing for the memorial. And after further study of the anthracite industry, submitted a model of his proposed sculpture to Richard Mitchell, John Mitchell's son, for approval in February of 1923. Excavations for the foundations began in July. It was hoped that the memorial would be ready, for, ready to dedicate for John Mitchell Day that October, but alas. A dispute over the bas-release carvings caused the dedication to be postponed initially to August 1st of 1924, which would, would have been the anniversary of the eight-hour workday in the mines, uh, but even that ended up not, cut, not working out as they, as they had hoped. Um, at the end of March, three carloads of granite arrived from Vermont, and workers began installing the rotunda on Courthouse Square. A carving on the back of the rotunda showing a miner at home with his family alone weighed, weighed, weighed 14 tons. The dedication, with suitable fanfare, was scheduled for May 30th, 1924. The festivities kicked off with a dinner at the Hotel Casey on Thursday evening, followed by a massive parade of miners setting off around the downtown, led by Lawrence's band, at noon on Friday. The monument itself, itself was unveiled by John Mitchell's daughter, Catherine, and the ceremony included speeches from John L. Lewis, the international president of the UMW, uh, Reverend John Curran, the pastor of St. Mary's Church, who had helped Mitchell, Mitchell organize the miners in 1902, uh, my beloved Ronaldo Capellini, uh, the president of UMW District 1, and Pennsylvania Governor Gifford Pinchot. Samuel Gompers was supposed to attend as well, but he was sick and sent, sent a representative. Scranton Mayor John Durkin noted the appropriateness of placing the statue in Scranton, calling it the city that welcomed your leader in the early days of your struggles, the city that cheered him and yelled him and encouraged him, the city wherein he had his warmest friends, his most ardent admirers, his best counselors, the city that provided him with the sinews of war and gave him, he gave him a membership in its organization of his most loyal followers. Father Curran called Mitchell's work fundamental, safe, and permanent for the progress of the family, the home, and the nation while the monument itself would stand as an everlasting, ever, everlasting memorial to his friend. When, when, when the coal shall all have been mined from the, beneath the surface of the anthracite regions, when the name of the coal digger shall well nigh have been forgotten, this stone, this adamantine rock, shall still tell the story of the ancient coal miners of these parts and of the modern David who once, stood up, once upon a time slew the giant of avarice, of injustice, and of tyranny. Uh, back in 1903, during the closing arguments of the Anthracite Strike Commission, Clarence Darrow said of Mitchell, I want to say one word for that cool, calm, considerate, humane leader who, from the beginning to the end, has come out of every contest victorious, has faced every situation and won, not because he is wiser, not because he is greater, not because he is better than the rest, but because his face is turned toward the morning and the future, and he is moving with the progress of the world. It is perhaps fitting, then, that the UMW placed Mitchell's statue on the east side of Courthouse Square, looking into the rising sun. 
Okay, give me a second here. Um, I will show you. There's the um, the photos of the dedication from the the newspaper. And you see, this is um, there it is. Uh, this is the Scranton Republican from May 31st. Um, there's the the photo of from from Courthouse Square from from the dedication. This is the, the Mitchell Monument itself. Um, the statue was apparent was still draped in the in the photo. Um, there's a flag wrapped over the, the bronze statue of Mitchell. Uh, the granite rotunda has two quotations engraved on the sides uh, with the medallion on the top for the UMW and eight hour workday. And as I said before, um, one of the greatest parts of the of the memorial um, you can't see from from this photo um, is the scene that's engraved on the back of a, a miner's family at home. Um, looking through the, the door, you could see a, a breaker, a breaker in the background. Um, and there's a father and a son at the table, and there's a sense that one is coming home from work and one is leaving. Um, and it gives it gives the sense of um, the, obviously the the importance of coal mining to the region, and then also um, to the importance to Mich to Mitchell as sort of the representative of this is why we continue to do this. Um, he has you know to to work so hard to um, to make coal mining a little bit better than it was. Um, still pretty awful but um Mitchell holds 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 great 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 impetus um great importance in the in the region uh he is buried in Cathedral Cemetery and I think every time I've gone there uh there is still coal left on his grave um to this day um I see Marianne has the, the big giant stand up of the Mitchell monument um behind her uh, <laughs> I do I, I just I brought him out um and I I did find a few statistics that might um add to what we're not getting because our, our friend Darlene didn't make it, unfortunately. Um, but the artist who designed the monument was a man named Charles Keck, K-A-C-K. -K. The architect was Peter Sheridan, and it was cast by the Roman Bronze Works. It's a bronze statue of Mitchell um, in the front of a granite memorial with scenes carved into the niche in the front. Niche, niche in the front and on the back, which Sarah talked a lot about uh, the back and the family, the miners family. Um, the sides of the structure are flanked with curving benches. So if you've ever gone down to Courthouse Square, you can actually sit on these benches and kind of visit with John Mitchell. Um, the lifelike heroic scale bronze statue shows John Mitchell, the first president of the United Mine Workers of America, standing with his right hand extended. In his left hand, he holds some papers and a book, and he's wearing a vest and unbuttoned knee length coat. Behind John Mitchell is the carved scene of the mine shaft interior with seven miners, a mule and a coal car. And as Sarah said on the reverse is the miners kitchen scene carved um, in relief showing the miners family at home. And it was, as she said, executed in 1923, dedicated in May 30th, 1924. Um, it's a great, great carving and a great piece. And um, if you recall, there was a point for a few years when Lackawanna County Courthouse Square was redesigned and they took out the sidewalks that led you to the back of the monument. So um, it was kind of disheartening, um, but happily the Historical Society was asked to come in and kind of tell them what was wrong with the redesign. And we said, you must put the sidewalks back because you have to get to the back of the monument. Um, we worry about the back of the monument too, because it is kind of uh, eroding a little bit. But if you look at the picture Sarah just pulled up, you can notice it's hard to see right behind the miner's son, the man standing with his mine helmet on, you can see the doorway and out the doorway, you can see an image of a coal breaker. So it really points out that their entire life was consumed with the industry. Um, and then if Richard Stanislas was here, I think he would talk a little bit about the facial features of the folks in this, this relief. They have almost a Roman look to them. So he's kind of, the, the sculptor is reflecting on that truly classical artist um, rendition of people and what they should have looked like. So um, it's, it's an interesting piece. And if you've never walked around to the back of the monument, um, we strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, Sarah, that's what I have. I don't know if okay. there's anybody else. Uh, one of our one to... of our, our tour guides when we do the, the walking tours around Courthouse Square always likes to point out as well the cat and the dog in the <laughs> in, in the in the sculpture on the on the in the relief on the on the back. Um they are they are Joyce's favorite things in all of Scranton. Uh the, the cat and the dog again, just with that that whole idea of of family. To close out with a, a big finish, um Darlene Miller Landing has joined us um from the Hope Horn Gallery. Um so Darlene, if I could ask you to to chime in, um she may have some more have some more information about the the, uh, the the monument itself and the artwork on the on the monument. 
I'm so sorry to be late. Um, I was having some computer issues here. We had an upgrade a day or so ago and it did things I didn't expect. <laughs> <laughs> so I am that happens. Very, very that's, sorry that's part of the part of the fun to keep everybody, you know, um, hanging that way, uh, which is which is not a good thing. Um, I can show you a couple of pictures if you've got a second, if you're still willing to to stay put for a minute. Um, sure. Sure. If Please I do. can if I can do what I think I'm doing <laughs> again with, with my, with my upgrades here that are less than helpful. Did I lose everything? Um, Cher, did it work? Here's Sharon. You're there. Ooh, yes. Very good. good. Yay. <laughs> again, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I only like do oh. this every day of my life uh, and it usually works. It went away. Um, did it go away? We did just it? see your desktop. We see your desktop now. There it is. Oh, there it is. The other thing is that I have two monitors. So ah. um, yeah, when one flips over to the other, then something happens. Okay, now this is the big moment. Here it comes. From <laughs> Woohoo! Yay! Yeah. Yay! Okay, so um Sarah probably talked a lot about the um history of John Mitchell and the strike, right? In 1902, um, and, and all of the stuff that led up to that, the history of it. So Mitchell is the, the president of the United Mine Workers and, you know, very instrumental with uh, the strike and um, the miners, that's a really big win for them. So they are very um, devoted to him, right? They, they have a great sense of, of, of dedication. Uh, so Mitchell passes away in 1919 and um, following his death a little while, a little while out, uh, the, the monument is commissioned and, and erected. So Charles Keck and Peter Sheridan are the people who were involved. Keck is doing the sculptural part and Sheridan is doing the um, setting, the bench and the housing and sort of the architectural stuff. So the monument itself is a combination of um, bronze and granite and it's completed and dedicated in 1924. So if you go down to Courthouse Square, you know, everybody's been through and they've seen it. So that's that's what we uh, have there now. Uh, that was the day that it was dedicated. I don't know. Did, did you show that so far, Sarah, the, the image of that? there were. I like, did, yes. I was news, able to pull up yeah. the, news, the newspaper, had the that newspaper front page. There. So it was quite a quite a turnaround. So so a couple of dates are falling into place here, right? The big strike is in 1902. Um, Mitchell dies in 1919. This is dedicated in 1924. There are also some labor issues shaping up in the 1920s. So um, all of that stuff is is kind of building and going on, so that it's not a it's not a topic that um, stopped being interesting to people, right? They, there was still some momentum going forward with a lot of these issues that had been involved with that strike, and so Mitchell is a person who was still kind of a symbol for a lot of that. And the um, monument itself reveals a lot of those issues. So, if you were going to talk about this in our historical terms. Uh, again, there are a couple of components here. So there is what is called a sculpture in the round, and it's a bronze figure of Mitchell. Sculpture in the round is, a, again, an art history or a stylistic term. It just means you can walk around something. It's three-dimensional um, sculpture. Uh, the other part of this is the niche where that sculpture is located, like a little nook in the wall. Um, and it's kind of a, a semi-circular uh, space that's there. And along the back of it behind Mitchell is another kind of sculpture. So sculpture in the round is freestanding. You can walk around it. Uh, the other kind is a relief and that has one side attached to something. It's usually, um, often it's used on buildings. Uh, it's attached to something architectural. And so you see the miners here kind of carved into this wall. A um, Couple of neat things about that. So one is that the freestanding bronze figure of Mitchell uh, is is slightly bigger, I guess, than life size. So it's it, it's in this tradition of monumental bronze cast sculpture. Um, bronze is what's called an additive material. Um, there are two ways to make a sculpture. One is additive, where you can change it, add things to it. Uh, the other is reductive, which you can't change. Once something is gone from a reductive sculpture, usually it's stone or wood, and you chip away at it. Once you've chipped the thing away, you're not putting it back, right? So you've reduced it, and that's that's that. It's a one one shot sort of deal. Um, but for an additive figure, uh, usually a big bronze sculpture is made first in clay, and so there's a large, maybe wooden or metal frame. It's called an armature, and then that's covered with sometimes wire or, or wood to sort of bulk it up. And then clay is covering the outside of that, which is sort of sculpted and modeled to um, get whatever sort of shapes or features 
uh, the artist desires. And so the Mitchell um, figure is is very lifelike. He's wearing a, a very dignified kind of coat. He's standing with an arm outstretched, you know, as a friend to labor. Um, so that that follows in a tradition that goes back literally thousands of years. I mean, in ancient Rome, there were life-size sculptures of um, emperors and military leaders. So, you know, it's a, it's a long tradition. Uh, but to cast a full-size bronze sculpture, again, it's a big project. It involves this armature and then it involves this kind of additive clay sculpture. Uh, and then a mold made out of plaster or some other kinds of materials sometimes that are added to that um, is made based on that, that clay, um, it's called a maquette, that clay model. And so then the thing is cracked open, kind of like an Easter egg, and you take the clay out, put the mold back together, and you fill it up with bronze. Um, if you're dealing with a figure that's over life size, you need a lot of people to do that, right? To handle that amount of bronze, uh, probably doubled in weight because you've got the the weight of the um, the mold itself, right? That you're dealing with. And then the bronze, when you pour it in, is hot. It's liquid. So you need to have some sort of a forge and a foundry. So it would be something that was done in an atelier with a lot of um, assistants helping and working like a big sculpture workshop. Uh, so the fact that there's a life-size, you know, bronze of um, John Mitchell in Courthouse Square was not a passing, you know, fanciful idea. There was a lot of time and thought and planning and organization and not to mention financing involved in that. So it was a big, a big enterprise. Um, the relief sculpture behind Mitchell shows the miners. And so you see them, um, depending on the different kinds of lighting conditions that happen down there, there are kind of like shadows that they cast. And it's sort of an interesting um, effect that happens when when that's going on. Uh, they're done in what's called high relief. So you can see them standing away from the back part of the stone that they're sculpted from, the back area, uh, pretty, pretty high, right? You know, like maybe at least an, an inch kind of thing, and in some areas even deeper. The higher the relief, the darker the shadows. So um, if something stands out, you know, maybe an inch, two, three inches from the background, it's going to cast a deeper shadow than something that only stands maybe half an inch. So it's a way of suggesting space um, in terms of light and dark. So it's not just the the actual texture, but it's that, that shading that is part of uh, what happens in a relief sculpture as well. So that's a, a really um, carefully crafted kind of image back there. It relates, again, to older traditions in art history. It's a row of figures, and that goes back to antiquity in what's called a frieze, a line of figures. So that frieze of miners, you know, across the back of that, that niche, um, you know, you can see friezes of figures all the way back again into Roman art on public buildings or the, the big Greek temples have friezes that show activities that have been taking place uh, in those areas and those environment environments, like maybe at a temple, a celebration of um, a festival for a goddess or something, right? So there are all of these very kind of classical elements that are part of the, the sculpture um, in terms of that figure in the round. And then also that relief that's in the back. It's interesting too, in terms of subject matter that miners in a way are, are kind of like sculptures, right? They kind of do relief sculpture. They chip away at things in a reductive fashion when they are facing a wall of, of anthracite in the mine, uh, they're chipping away at that wall in a way very similar to um, the method that the artist would have used to chip away at that granite to reveal um, those figures as part of that sculpture. So it, it, it's kind of interesting that the material and the uh, technique are, are connected in that way. So it's a really uh, sort of sensitive and insightful um, decision to make to, to represent the miners in that way. There are inscriptions on either side of the figure. You don't see them in this particular view, but they are around like on the sides of that sort of um, pillar sort of thing, that structure that the niche is carved into. Um, and they are again, quotes dealing with the idea of um, the striking miners and, and the concessions and uh, what they are fighting for in terms of labor and the, the rights of workers. So far as discontent is expressed in constructive movements for human betterment, it is healthy and to be encouraged. So this isn't just a protest for um, reasons of uh, anger or bad attitude or, or causing trouble, right? It's it's something that's constructive and it's leading towards um, human betterment. So it's actually a very healthy thing. Uh, and then the other, I wish to see the interests and ideals of labor and capital fairly reconciled, not by surrender, but by mutual understanding. So it isn't a fight in, in sort of a, 
an aggressive, angry sort of way. It's it's a, a protest and it's it's discontent that's expressed in a constructive way. And it, it isn't the kind of um, conflict where somebody has to win and somebody has to lose, right? There isn't this idea of loss or surrender, um, but the idea that mutual understanding, everybody will benefit from uh, this 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 kind of recognition of problems and and a, a resolution that's that's positive for both parties, right? So a lot of those ideas are expressed on the monument again in really um, beautiful kind of ways. I also like the top above on um, the figure is another inscription, champion of labor, defender of human rights, and a really beautiful kind of circular emblem that has UMW, which is the United Mine Workers, uh, and the class pants. So that is a, a symbol of the union. So. The first part is about workers and, and John Mitchell as a leader kind of stepping forward and, and leading um, the miners who are engaged in this, this kind of uh, extractive industry. And it's very difficult and physical and um, should be, you know, there should be compensation equal to the effort and the skill and talent uh, that goes into that. But the other side, whoop, come back, is this. And so if you walk around the back, um, when we go downtown a lot, I take my classes down there. Um, a lot of people tell me they never thought to walk around the back, the back of that, that kind of, again, architectural form that the sculpture, the bronze part is standing in front of also has another relief on the back. And that one is representing a miner's family. So tell me what you see in the miner's family. The reason the miners are fighting, again, is not just because, oh, they're angry and they have a bad attitude. They're fighting for the betterment of their families and, um, you know, things that are important to them. So if you look at that image, can you identify anybody or can you see anything kind of significant in it that might relate to things that the miners feel are important to them? I yeah. think yeah. I'm sorry, we hear you. <laughs> it's just, I'm it's waiting for somebody else to, to, to chime in. Um, I know you, you can't really see it in the in the in the picture. Um it's it's kind of worn down, but the the one um the one wall hanging on the wall does says says home sweet home. This home um, sweet so home. it's a, a nice, yeah. nice kind of warm family family yeah. thing um the son's holding his lunchbox he's ready to ready to go um mm -hmm. and there is a clock behind the father there on the on the other the on the other pediment oh the other thing i forgot to say inside the up here under this eight hours right they're fighting for the eight hour day so the fact that a clock shows up over here is another reference to that idea that there is time right there's time for work there's time for leisure there's time for family um and the son is here with his with his lunchbox out through the door again you can't see it real well in this particular image but there is a breaker back here so you know where he's going to go to work he's dressed in his overalls he's wearing his miner's helmet with the lantern um, on it and he is going to work in the mines leaving home sweet home going to work uh what is this stuff here can you understand what that is can you make that out do they live in a in a fancy house it's home sweet home but is it like rich is it no is the it... plasters plasters yeah. coming off the wall exactly the plasters coming off the wall so they are it's home sweet home <laughs> it's well kept it looks like it's clean and orderly but it is not um a luxurious mansion so if the miners are asking for better wages and better working hours they're not asking for it out of greed they're asking for it as a basic um necessity right so those kinds of things uh, are are images of that and the clock again this this kind of idea of time uh, being related to that uh, set of demands that they are uh, asking for so the this is this is not the dad sometimes my students say oh there's the dad and he seems like a mature man but he is actually the son of mm -hmm. these two figures right a woman and a, a man here and if you've ever been in the Catlin house there is a sculpture on the stairs by an artist named John Rogers it's called going to the parson and there's a young man and a young woman, and they're going to see, you know, make arrangements to have a marriage. And behind them, there are two animals. Have you ever seen them? They're kind of like looking at each other in an apprehensive kind of way. <laughs> it's a cat and a dog. So the idea that um, cats represent women and dogs represent men um, in that going to the parson, the young couple is all happy in love now, but you get the feeling that sort of, you know, the saying, they're going to be fighting like cats and dogs. <laughs> uh, in the family here, they're not, right? In the family here, the cat is very loving and leaning up against the woman's leg. And the dog is um, lying on the floor under the table by the, the father's feet. So it seems like it's a harmonious household, right? The cat and the dog are um, living peacefully with each other and with the family members. So you see 
that kind of loving interaction uh, between the people who are represented there. Where else do you see it? Like with the kids and stuff. Any other good examples? Well, on a different subject, can I just say yeah. that that five children is pretty normal. That was that was small. An actually. family back there. That yeah, that was that was even that was average actually. Right. Uh, they were nine, ten, eleven would not be uncommon, but it was my usually husband. average was about five or six. My uh, husband's family had infant, thirty. <laughs> infant mortality rate was 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 very high. Yes, huge. Um, if you could make it to your seventh birthday, that was an accomplishment. So. Uh, uh, again, the idea of um, being able to support your family and make sure that everybody has food and shelter and clothing, um, you know, when you've got a family of five, that's that's a lot, you know, that's a lot to take on. Uh, there are five of them here. You can count them up. Sometimes my students forget that this one is here, right? So there's a, an almost grown man, right? Maybe in his 18, 22, that kind of time frame. Uh, then there are two children that seem to be maybe like a, a young teen, a girl, and then a boy who's maybe like 10, give it, give or take. And then two, maybe younger again by four or five years. So maybe one that's three, four, and then one that's maybe one or two. So one, two, three, four, five, pretty much in order of their ages. Uh, he's dressed for work. What about these two, the girl and the boy? Would you wear a little tie if you were going to go and be a breaker boy? No, probably not. It seems like an OSHA hazard. Right. Yes, definitely. So another big thing that was um, of a concern to the miners was the idea of child labor. So they wanted um, safe and well-paid working conditions for mature workers. Uh, the grown son <clears throat> is certainly, you know, <clears throat> and, and able to go into the mines and work in a safe and productive <clears throat> kind of way. Uh, but his younger brother should go to school. Right. He, he should go and be educated to the point where when he's old enough to work, he may have a choice. He can go and work in the mines or maybe he's going to be an engineer or maybe he can be something totally different, a doctor, or a teacher, or a lawyer, who knows, whatever. Um, but to send someone into the mines when they're eight, 10 years old, uh, Lewis Hine used to uh, do a lot of the photographs of the miners and the breaker boys and child labor and things like this. Um, and his take on that was that you were holding them into a pay scale that they would never be able to surpass because that lack of education would eventually catch up with them, right? Uh, Arlene? So, yeah. Yeah. The um the, the light on the young on the minor boy's hat mm -hmm. almost dates this in time. It's it's like in the 20s and 30s. Exactly. Which is, yes. which is yes. more or less after breaker boys were not being used as much anymore. So that would have been, right, the legacy of the older generation. Maybe his correct, dad correct. would have been a breaker yes. boy. He is not, and his little brother will not be, because his dad is the one who fought the fight in the strike of 1902, right? He's the one in the 1920s who's reaping the benefits of that, right? So if his dad in 1902 was a mature worker, say maybe in his 30s, and he would have been a young boy who was maybe eight or 10. We're now, say, 20 years out from that. And he's maybe in his 20s. He's grown and working now. Yeah. Um, those two generations of minors, it, it, it's it's also, this is an old Roman idea too. Uh, the idea that you're, um, you acknowledge the, the contributions of your ancestors, right? That you have this um, kind of family lineage and you respect the wisdom of your elders and the work that they've done on your behalf. So the young man standing in the doorway, the workers of 1920 were not the ones who fought in the strike of 1902. The previous generation, their their fathers were the ones who took on that battle and they were the ones then in turn who benefited from it. So that's that's a really beautiful relationship between those two, the, the oldest son and the dad. Uh, that the dad did something and now he's he's sitting he's not working he's going to go to work but he's probably again he's of the age where he won't work forever you know everybody ages and and finally retires out of the workforce in some some sort of way uh but he is the one who is the active upright figure and he's the one who's taking on you know the legacy of that strike and the gains that were made um with with john mitchell um at that time period so it's it's a commemoration of that strike and of Mitchell's contributions, but there's also an acknowledgement of the people who were supporting the structure of that monument now, right? It's that second generation in the 20s that wants to see it erected in recognition of that stuff that's gone before. 
so that's that's kind of a neat thing again to have those sort of two stages the the initial stuff with the strike that happens and then the idea that that second generation is going to um value and acknowledge it uh so that that kind of carries that on uh, so one other thought yeah i just express one other thought sorry um uh, given the time frame the family could likely be would certainly be more likely a southern or an eastern european probably at yes this time because by 1900 uh, the majority of the workforce were from southern uh, eastern europe and one reason why bishop hoban would send in curran as his envoy to the strike settlement was that the majority of the mine workers were catholic by yes. that uh, you know they 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 were the they were the invasive species so to speak <laughs> in 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 the anthracite region uh, the wasps who had been here and who had been the miners they cooperated to in, in the strike of 02 and and 00 the welsh english scots um uh, germans uh, etc uh, they had accommodated with this influx of the slavs and the italians and they had a peace you know, sarah said john mitchell talked about that mm -hmm. um uh, but, but but it wasn't easy it wasn't easy because these newcomers were catholic only the irish previously had been catholic they didn't speak english they had very large families and the existing population were very much afraid of being replaced by these these newcomers as we are today many whites are are afraid to be replaced by the by the immigrants but keep in mind back here finally that these slavs and these italians were not considered white they were not white they were considered some lesser species some of you have heard me talk about this yeah. That they they were seen, and the Irish were actually barely becoming white as they had begun to rise. But in 1840 and 50 and 60, they were not seen as white. The good book on this is how the Irish became white. It's been out about 20, 25 years. So they have Roman Romanesque features, as as Marianne pointed out earlier. Uh, classical, classical. I mean, they could have been could have been Italians from the north. I mean, they they're more classically Italian. But anyway. <laughs> We don't, we don't know what their ethnicity was, but at this point, the majority of the mine working families were Eastern and Southern European. Well, then in art history, the, the neoclassical style borrows from the Greek and Roman tradition. Yeah. And there are there are some other sculptors like throughout the 19th century who were doing very particular subjects. Um, one is a woman, Edmonia Lewis, who uh, had Native American and Black ancestry. And she was carving in this white marble. Um, she was a woman artist, which was a, a crazy, you know, thing to begin with. Uh, then she she is again this person with this biracial heritage, and a lot of her sculptures in this white marble in this very classical style uh, showed a, a man and a woman from say like a, a story from history or literature. So um, the Song of Hiawatha is one, and the old Indian arrow maker and his daughter. Another one is. Forever Free, which shows a, a man and a woman in, that, that are um, emancipated. And the male figure has um, a much more ethnic kind of quality, maybe a hairstyle or, or Native American dress or something. And then the female figures look very classical. So it's, it's partly a stylistic thing. And um, that neoclassical style was associated with dignity. So if you were going to portray them in this sort of Roman-ish way, uh, with that classical kind of um, illusion. That was, again, something that was considered kind of monumental and dignified. So you were dignifying these workers by showing in, you know, in, in that sort of older art historical tradition. Um, but you, you make a good point because there are a lot of variations on that, depending on what artist you're looking at. Um, in my own family, you make a good point. Uh, maybe, you know, if you've been around the historical society, I think I've probably told this a couple of times. My grandfather's family was very waspy, um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, right? Like way back. And he married a woman whose father and grandparents had been born in what today would be, I guess, Ukraine. They called it Ruthenia. Uh, her family was not only Catholic, but Orthodox. <laughs> so there was that. They spoke Ruthenian and they used the Cyrillic alphabet. They didn't even have the same alphabet. And I guess uh, my grandfather's family almost died a thousand deaths when, when that happened. And he was speedily disowned until everybody kind of calmed down and, and you know, accepted the fact. And 
I said to him, you know, you, you got married really against the wishes of the family. That took a lot of, a lot of courage. Why did you do that? And he said, oh, she was such a pretty little thing, right? <laughs> so it, 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 it could be done, you know, you could kind of surmount those, those divisions and, and Mitchell did it, but it was difficult. Um, it was, it was a, a couple of sets of long held traditions and hard to, to find the common ground right beyond that. So that is a, a really big factor in that story. Well, right around the same time when this monument was put up, Congress passed two laws uh, to keep out the yeah. Southern and the Eastern Europeans. Uh, we, we, and they were passed. So if you have Southern or Eastern European ancestry, I guarantee you, your ancestors came before 1924-25. They were in the late 1800s. Yeah. yeah or, or, or Chinese. Yeah. Or <laughs> Chinese. Because we didn't want this riffraff. They were destroying and demeaning the country. Uh, and so we got to keep those kind of people out. And we did. And and they came, you know, in, in really large numbers. And it also was kind of uh, amazing to me that on one hand, you know, there's legislation to keep them out. And yet on the other, if you look through um, sometimes on Ancestry, if you're on Ancestry.com, you can find the ship's records. And it seemed like, um, to me anyway, I've, I can track some family members, that there were uh, steamship lines or, or probably connected to uh, mining companies that were like actively recruiting people to come over, you know, because they wanted that labor force. So it it's, you know, you you want the you want the labor source, but you don't want the the change in culture, right? <laughs> it's, it's kind of a catch-22. Um but that that is a, a big component of it. Again, I, I apologize for my my late entry. <laughs> I do. I do love it. It's a beautiful monument. I That's like all right. This is this is some really, really great insight. I there's there, I, I learned things. There are things I didn't I didn't I didn't realize about it. Not to put anybody on the spot, but uh, Charlie Compass, I know you had written an article about the Mitchell Monument for the Miner's Lamp. Um, if you have anything you'd like to add about this. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you'd like to chime in, please do. I do remember that um, at the time, the trolley systems were all clogged up, bringing people in to this dedication ceremony. It was a, sort of a madness on the transportation system, bringing all those people in. And I thought that was interesting. It's the, the, the union locals had all, had all organized together to join in, in, this, in this parade. Um, I think a lot of them, they walked, some of them walked up from, from where they were. Um, and the groups in the Mid, in the mid Valley uh, walked to Scranton to be part of, to be part of the parade. Um, there were you know, thousands of people in, involved in this. Um, we like to clog the streets for a good parade in Scranton. Also, Sarah, it should be mentioned that the local unions also do an annual celebration there every year. They do. Um, there's usually something on, on Labor Day at the, at the statue and then for, for Mitchell Day. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the UMW did also put up um, a stone to Mitchell in Cathedral Cemetery. So their, their original plan to do something in the cemetery, they did follow through on that. Um, there are in the cemetery, there are smaller stones for Mitchell and his wife. And then there's a, a larger stone that with, with just Mitchell's name on it. Um, that mm -hmm. was, was put in, it was installed by the, by the UMW. So they, they do have, they did get kind of two bites at the apple, um, although one is much more awesome than the other one. Um, and they do a like ceremony the, the over there statue. too, Sarah, every mm -hmm. year. Yeah. 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 We, we still we still remember Mitchell very fondly in, in Scranton. Well, he is so. certainly, this is Bob, he is certainly identified with Scranton a whole lot. Um, and uh, of course he was buried from um, the, the cathedral church. And I gather that the bishop at the time, who I've not recalling his name, it wasn't Hoban, uh, whoever the bishop was at that time, said the mass. And Monsignor Curran, who was his colleague in helping settle the O2 strike, Curran had been appointed as the ambassador, so to speak, of the Catholic Church of the Diocese of the Cross in 1902, uh, because Pope Leo XIII had written Rerum Navarum, Mm -hmm. back in the early 1890s, and that was the Catholic Church's uh, a statement behind labor and especially behind labor unions because Leo XIII realized that he better pay attention to labor unions and the working man because if he didn't, the communists were coming. They were organizing in Europe at the time. That's right. And so the Catholic Church had to pay attention to the working class. And so... Hoban points uh, appoints Curran 
and Karen and Mitchell really hit it off. And and they were, and Teddy Roosevelt, they, they were a, a great threesome in helping settle uh, the O2 strike. And then of course, uh, Curran helps uh, convert Mitchell to Catholicism. Mitchell's wife is a Catholic, but he's not. But uh, uh, before he dies, uh, shortly, relatively shortly before he dies, he becomes a Catholic, and uh, and this is why he's buried, you know, from the cathedral, and why he's also why he's a, a, a buried ceremony from the cathedral, and why his body lays in uh, in cathedral cemetery. Yeah, it was, it was his request to be to be buried in in Scranton. Yeah. Does anyone else have any any other questions? No, I have a comment, Sarah. When Mary sure, Mary and, Men, yeah, Mary Ann Dunleavy was training me on the courthouse tour many years ago. When we got to this, she talked about Mitchell got the people who couldn't speak the same language working together, although they never spoke to each other, to you know get all the benefits for the miners. And I always tell the people when I do the tours, I tell them that today. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, one of the, the problems to unionization had always been that they're working with different et, different disparate ethnic elements. Didn't speak the same language, weren't the same religion, had ancient distrust of each other. Um, part of part of the, the impetus of Mitchell working with Father Curran was to tie them all together um, mm -hmm. and find find some some common ground from people who had you know historically disliked each other um, and find a, a way to to work together and, and find common ground and move forward. And, and Mitchell had a core of organizers. He had his Polish organizers, his Lithuanian organizers. I interviewed one of his Polish organizers, who was then in his like his, his 90s. Uh, he, wow. he he had wow. his you know Italian organizers between maybe 12, 15, he'd send out he, he was well organized. He, he he knew what he was doing. I might make a plug for the uh travel abroad to Scotland and Wales. On the trip we were on, we got to see this really neat sculpture in downtown Cardiff. And on the front side of the sculpture was like all the coal barons in all their regalia. Oh, wow. And then hidden, hidden on the back side where nobody would know unless, except for our tour guide took us back there, was the, the, the coal miners and whales underneath. And the rich barons were working on the backs of the labor of all these miners. And you wouldn't know this if you walk along the street to look at those details or look at the back of a sculpture to see that hidden message that was there and represent so true of what was represented. So I encourage people to look into that trip because I'm sure this will be just as good. Neat. That's interesting. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Darlene, thank you for, for, for tuning in um, and sharing some of your, your insight into the statue, into the memorial itself. Um, I'm glad everyone was able to, to join us for Anthracite Heritage Month. Um, and please tune in again. Uh, we will probably be doing something later in May, another program um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the memorial again um, in time for the dedication. Our next program for Lock, Lock, Lackawanna Pastimes, will be February 23rd, will be joined by Maureen Morgan, a uh, native of Wales. We'll be talking about connections between Wales and America and Wales and Scranton, primarily through music. Uh, Mari is a vocalist herself, so there may be some singing involved. Um, we'll be looking at um, the connections and the heritage of Welsh, uh, the, the Welsh in America. Um, so again, thank you everyone for, for joining us and have a great day. <laughs>